Today, I'm going to go through some of the stuff that uh, uh, Carl talked about yesterday. Uh, but first, um, I'm just going to discuss briefly what I mean by schizophrenia and what it might be applied to, um, and talk about two uh, key kind of neurobiological abnormalities in the disorder, which I think pretty much everyone would agree on. How you then interpret those abnormalities and model them is probably uh, more contentious. But and one of these, as Carl mentioned yesterday, is this idea of a loss of uh, synaptic gain at high levels in, in the, in the uh, cortical hierarchy. And another is an uh, increase in striatal dopamine. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the idea of precision and how precision <laughs> might re relate to synaptic gain. And I'm going to talk about the various roles uh, put forward for dopamine and how these might um, uh, implicate theories of schizophrenia. And then I'm going to switch to talking uh, less, a bit less mechanistically um, about uh, attempts to model how delusions might come about. And these kind of fall into two uh, categories. The, kind of, the, the classic kind of uh, jumping to conclusions <laughs> type effect, which is uh, an explanation of how delusional ideas might arise. And then what I'd call um, sticking to conclusions or, or the, uh, the, a mechanism whereby these ideas might, might stay because, because uh, getting a strange belief and then hanging on to that belief uh, might be two very different uh, kinds of process. And lastly, if there's uh, time permitting, I'll talk a bit more about attempts to model uh, negative symptoms with uh, predominantly reinforcement learning uh, models. Okay, so just as a very brief intro for people who might not be familiar with um, uh, the concept of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is essentially a quite heterogeneous um, syndrome. Uh, and for the diagnosis, you need just uh, two of any of these symptoms, which are divided up into these uh, different categories that you can see here. Uh, now, the main, the commonest symptoms and the most, the, the, the kind of man in the street uh, madness symptoms are these positive, so-called positive symptoms at the top, uh, delusions and hallucinations. And uh, in schizophrenia in particular, the commonest kinds of delusions are the kind of persecutory delusions, <laughs> feelings that people are out to get you in some way. But there are, there are many others. And uh, in terms of hallucinations, the commonest are, are hearing voices, but there are also um, uh, hallucinations in other modalities. And uh, another important group of symptoms, which I've already alluded to, are these negative symptoms, which are essentially not the ab presence of something <laughs> abnormal, but the absence of something that should be there. So uh, a lack of willpower, a lack of sociability, lack of uh, uh, emotional expression. Um, so it's, it's kind of this family and this family that I'm largely going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about any of these psychomotor phenomena or, or uh, cognitive or uh, disorganization. Um, and what, just to give a brief background to these, uh, what I've described as these two major kind of neurobiological uh, pathologies in schizophrenia. So firstly, we have this idea of, uh, of a loss of synaptic gain in higher hierarchical areas of the cortex. So what is the, what is the evidence for this? So this is, uh, th there's a large amount of genetic evidence which, which implicates the NMDA receptor um, a, a specific kind of glutamate receptor, which um, is very important for the control of synaptic gain, uh, and also the, the, the post-synaptic density and, the, and the, um, the signaling pathways that lead from the NMDA receptor to, to its intracellular effects, like the uh, production of other excitatory receptors, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in neuropathological evidence, you can see fewer glutamatergic synapses in, in the prefrontal, especially in prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, i.e. high hierarchical areas. Thirdly, you have this idea that ketamine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, can induce psychotic-like symptoms, not proper psychotic symptoms, but uh, symptoms which are reasonably close. And there is also evidence that um, there's hypofunction of uh, GABAergic interneurons, particularly in prefrontal cortex, which themselves have NMDA receptors. And so if the NMDA receptors aren't working, it may be a cause of interneuronal dysfunction. And these GABA interneurons are extremely important for setting up this kind of balance of excitatory and inhibitory firing, which permits sustained oscillations in prefrontal cortex. And uh, without being able, if, you're, if you can't sustain oscillatory firing, then um, the prefrontal cortex is less able to communicate with other, other areas because as uh, 
populations in, in uh, separated areas that oscillate together are better able to communicate with each other. And so an impairment of this oscillatory function is, is like a, a, an impairment of oscillatory gain, really, rather than synaptic gain per se. And also there's a small amount of evidence for, for, for dopamine hypoactivity in D1 receptor hypoactivity in prefrontal cortex. So put all of these things together and you have a loss of synaptic gain, a loss of influence of prefrontal and uh, hippocampal cortex over the rest of the cortical hierarchy. And on the other hand, the, uh, probably the most famous uh, abnormality in schizophrenia is this, this hyper-dopaminergic uh, state in the striatum, <laughs> especially at D2 receptors. And this was first discovered because it was noted that all antipsychotic drugs, and this remains the case even today after 60 years, um, work by blocking uh, D2 receptors specifically. And um, in the last kind of 20 years or, or, or more, uh, lots of um, PET studies have shown that in schizophrenia there's an increased presynaptic availability, so an increased synthesis of dopamine and release when provoked. Uh, so it seems that this is a, a presynaptic effect rather than any kind of dopamine 2 receptor uh, pathology. The receptors are increased a small amount, but, but, but not a huge amount. And also added to this is the, uh, is the point that not, uh, chronic amphetamine use and chron other chronic dopaminergic agoni agonist use can also cause psychosis. So we have these two kinds of effects which might be worth trying to uh, model. And just to illustrate this, uh, as Carl was making the point yesterday, this loss of synaptic gain at the top of the hierarchy seems also to be counterbalanced by an increase at the bottom, which may be a compensatory response to that. It might not be a primary pathology in its own right. And you can see it really nicely illustrated on, in the, on the study from Alan Antizovich, where he, compared, he just compared the connectivity of every single cortical area with the thalamus and uh, plotted the, connectivity, the differences in connectivity between uh, schizophrenic subjects and control subjects on the on this same brain and you can see that the the areas which are on average less connected to the thalamus in the schizophrenic subjects are this uh, the prefrontal cortex the cingulate cortex the medial temporal lobe all these high hierarchical areas but you can see also perfectly delineated all these primary cortical areas which are more connected than they should be so uh, m1 s1 a1 uh, and v1 so it's almost like a an imbalance uh, of synaptic gain in the hierarchy. And another, another point worth bearing in mind is this idea that uh, put forward by uh, Oliver Howes and Shishish Kapoor that, that, you ha that, that perhaps this frontotemporal dysfunction that we've already talked about and the other genetic factors and stress and drugs might all contribute in some way to this increased synthesis of dopamine. Although why this should be on a neurological, neurobiological level or indeed a computational level, uh, nobody's really got any good idea. And then this increased dopamine release then leads to psychotic symptoms. So they propose perhaps this is the kind of final common pathway of psychosis. Um, but uh, it's worth bearing in mind that this does seem to be the case for many pe uh, people with schizophrenia. So if you look at striatal dopamine synthesis uh, in healthy volunteers and compare that to people uh, uh, with psychosis, in psychosis it's... it's uh, significantly elevated, not, not by masses, but, but, but significantly. Um, but if you look at people who do not respond to anti-dopaminergic treatment, you don't find a uh, significant elevation, and instead you find more glutamatergic abnormalities in cingulate cortex. So even this might not actually be a final common pathway. There may be other routes to the same symptoms. Anyway, so with that on board, um, we'll talk about a bit more uh, about... Um, this loss of synaptic gain and how it might be um, modelled in Bayesian terms. Repeating a lot of what Carl said uh, yesterday, in fact. So I don't need to reintroduce the idea of the Bayesian brain, um, but the, the, the key point really is, that, is the, the, the reason uh, these uh, statistics are described as Bayesian is that you, it involves um, averaging or combining the information from two different probability distributions according to their precision. So you, you uh, take an average of these two means, but you weight them according to whichever piece of information is the most precise. So precision is extremely important in, uh, in, in Bayesian inference. And our um, point is that if you reduce the precision of uh, prior beliefs, which is what we believe is happening in, in schizophrenia, then, then you will shift your posterior belief towards your sensory evidence in this way. That's the, that's the whole 
whole points really in a nutshell. Um, and how uh, are uh, prior beliefs and uh, how does Bayesian inference actually take place in the brain? Well, a popular uh, model of uh, doing so is this idea of predictive coding, in which um, a, a generative model pr makes predictions of sensory input that cascade down this hierarchy, as um, Carl was illustrating yesterday. And um, as they uh, descend, they come right down to the bottom and are compared with sensory input, and any error signal is fed back uh, to revise this prediction. If it cannot revise this prediction, another error of signal is sent up and up and, and so on and so forth. And this model has had, this is a well-known paper by Graham Ballard in uh, 15 years ago now, showing that you can explain a lot of V1 receptive field uh, appearances uh, using by training a, a predictive coding network on, on uh, natural images. Um, but if, if the brain is performing Bayesian inference in this way, and if it's using the kind of distributions that Christoph was talking about yesterday, so Gaussian distributions or, or distributions that can be described uh, quite simply with the two sufficient statistics, their mean and their, their precision, then the, 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 the mean and precision ought to be encoded uh, neurobiologically in a way that allows them to interact in the way that they should interact in inference. And so Carl's point when he was talking about uh, precision and synaptic gain yesterday is essentially that if you're looking for a mechanism of turning up the volume on one piece of information and turning the volume down on another piece of information without actually changing the content of that information, what you want is a kind of multiplicative uh, factor, just like synaptic gain, that doesn't create information out of nothing, but can turn the volume up or down on, on uh, existing activity. And so this could be done by neuromodulators like dopamine or acetylcholine or serotonin, etc. Uh, but it also could happen in other ways, like uh, oscillatory dynamics, uh, etc. Anything that can, that can increase the influence of one uh, message over another. And it's been known, it's not a new idea by any means, that um, there is a lot of influence of, of, of predictions over perceptions in uh, schizophrenia. So, so uh, as uh, Carl mentioned yesterday, we have these um, smooth pursuit traces of, of a normal subject pursuing a target that just goes backwards and forwards at constant velocity. And you can see when the target's switched off, the uh, subject can carry on pursuing it at almost the correct speed. Um, and this part is driven purely by prediction, right? But this uh, schizophrenic subject can pursue it absolutely fine for this moment, but when the target's switched off, uh, he just loses that little bit extra of velocity and has to saccade much more to catch up when the target reappears. And look at, and this subject, you notice, um, is falling behind even when the target is visible. But notice his saccades are perfect. So he's, he's saccading back to the target. He can see the target. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's his predictive ability that is the, that is the problem. Um, and this, is re this lack of prediction is recapitulated in lots of other phenomena. So the hollow mass that you saw uh, yesterday, most people perceive this as a as a, as a convex face, but um, uh, those of schizophrenia perceive it as a, as a concave face, which is ver veridical. Um, they tend not to perceive these as different sizes, whereas most people do. Uh, and, and they tend not to be able to perceive these uh, this egg shape in this ring of um, uh, gabor patches. Um, but you can look for these predictive deficits uh, in all different kinds of um, modalities. So, so in the world of ERPs, when you present a sensory stimulus many, many times, average the cortical potentials and look for these characteristic waveforms that are produced by uh, noticing a sensory stimulus. You get, if you just present two simple clicks uh, to a control subject, you get one characteristic wave after the first click and then a smaller wave after the second click. It's almost as if something about the first click has has led the cortex to be, um, uh, to, to, if, well, if this um, is produced by predominantly a pred prediction error response, then it looks like the cortex has been able to predict this click a bit better than this click. However, in the uh, schizophrenic subject here, this first click is, uh, the set produces the same kind of wave as the control subject, but the second one produces exactly the same as the first. So there doesn't seem to be the same um, uh, predictive um, change. I, this second stimulus looks inappropriately surprising. Conversely, if you produce a whole train of clicks and then uh, an oddball, like a beep, 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 boop, 
then um, normal subjects will produce a much bigger deflection uh, at a later time to the, to the deviant. And you can see that here at 150 milliseconds and here again at 300 milliseconds. But these schizophrenic subjects do not seem to differentiate as much between the, the, the normal and the abnormal um, stimulus. So in this case, this, this oddball is inappropriately unsurprising. As Carl was saying yesterday, everything seems mildly surprising, except for the stuff that really should be surprising. And uh, Chris <laughs> Frith and, and Sarah Blakemore in the late 90s uh, produced a, a model of passivity symptoms, and, uh, which was based on the idea that if you are, if you predict the outcome of your uh, movements before you actually get the sensory feedback, then if the, something goes wrong with this prediction, it may it may uh, lead to a state in which your movements, even though you're uh, commanding them, feel as if they're uh, caused by some sort of alien force or feel uh, feel unfamiliar to you in some way. And um, some predictions of this model have been uh, subsequently verified. For example, in that force matching task that. Um, Carl talked about yesterday. So the question is, are all of these predictive deficits really explicable by just simply turning the precision down at a high level? Uh, they they might, may not be. And uh, as uh, the examples that Carl showed yesterday showed that when we uh, tried to reproduce these um, symptoms by, uh, by modeling them with a hierarchical model and just increasing the noise at a higher level in that, in that hierarchical model, we were able to reproduce the, the, the mismatch negativity and the um, smooth pursuit abnormalities and the force matching paradigm uh, just by reducing that precision. So potentially, uh, it, it, it seems a, a decent explanation. I'm not going to go through this model uh, now as there isn't time. And you've seen that already. But here you can see in our... Um, uh, schizophrenic sub, uh, computer subjects tracking this uh, stimulus. You can see every time the eye go, tracks this target through the occluder, it can track the target fine to begin with, but when it enters the occluder, it just slows down that little bit more than the normal subject's eye on each occasion, and a lot on this occasion. Okay, but um, can this reduced high-level precision account really be the whole story? Can it explain everything about the syndrome? And we've seen it can explain some of these perceptual phenomena, the, these smooth pursuit abnormalities, some electrophysiological findings, the passivity phenomena, and even the kind of delusional ideas or this state in which the world seems kind of mysterious and odd and you're kind of uh, noticing bizarre coincidences everywhere that you might, from which you might draw odd conclusions. But Thinking about it, the, the, the characteristic symptoms, that, the most commonest symptoms that we really, really want to explain are hallucinations and the, the, the maintenance of these fixed false beliefs which are impervious to sensory evidence. And so a priori, it seems as if a, a hallucination, if it's anything, is, is the imposition of a prior belief on, on noisy or absent sensory data. Um, and likewise, a, a delusion. Now, I would actually argue that these symptoms can be best explained uh, in this kind of model. I don't have time to do that. Um, don't have time to go into that now. But um, it may be that this, um, the, the, the maintenance of delusions is, 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 a, is, a, is a different process, and we have to look at um, a different model for that. And I'll come on to that in a moment. So we'll talk about striatal dopamine. So Rob, in Rob's talk yesterday, he outlined the different kinds of dopaminergic responses that you get uh, in the striatum. And you, it, this is a raster plot of lots and lots of dopaminergic <laughs> neurons. And you can see they're all kind of ticking away at this tonic kind of firing rate. And then in the middle of this, you have some stimulus is applied. And this is this phasic burst firing when the stimulus is applied. And then on a different stimulus, they, there's a phasic pause. So you have these, these, this tonic level, these phasic bursts, and these phasic pauses. And um, as Rob also uh, mentioned yesterday, the, uh, there are various um, prominent theories as to what these, uh, particularly these phasic responses, are all about. So on the one hand, there's lots of evidence that uh, something, well, that these phasic responses um, compute a kind of reward prediction error by comparing the amount of value that you get from moving one state and to another state with the actual reward that you got, and then uh, using the prediction error signal uh, 
to learn more about those states and revise your estimate of the value of those states so that in future you can make a better prediction. So this is all about learning. Um, but on the other hand, you have these other theories of dopamine put forward by uh, Kent Berridge uh, and others that, that, that say that dopamine isn't, any, isn't used for learning or isn't, uh, or, and certainly in his paradigms, isn't used for learning and instead is all about action selection and translating something, uh, the presence of some stimulus that you like into something that you're prepared to work for. And, and he terms this quality incentive salience. Um, and so what might, how might these be perturbed in schizophrenia and do these account for any symptoms? So we have this clear pet evidence that there is a much greater uh, presynaptic availability of dopamine in the striatum. And it does seem that there is that it likely that there is more tonic release because the, uh, the uh, antipsychotics act in a tonic way blocking uh, D2 receptors. Um, but what might happen for this phasic release pattern? Well, in other, in other um, psychiatric syndromes, it's thought that there is some kind of inverse relationship between the tonic and phasic release because there is some feedback on, on uh, some autoreceptor feedback reducing phasic release when tonic release is high. So, for example, if you have a normal state with tonic firing and, and, and phasic firing, if tonic firing goes down, phasic firing can go up, and this is reported to be an explanation for impulsivity uh, phenomena. Whereas when tonic firing increases in pain and stress syndromes, you can get blunting of this phasic uh, uh, signaling. But it seems in schizophrenia, really, that, uh, and we'll come on to this shortly, that if anything, it's not as simple as this. It seems that the phasic responses are anything not just diminished, but disordered in some way. The, 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 their computation seems, seems, seems aberrant. And it may actually be the, the inputs to the, the dopamine neurons that we should be looking at, not the dopamine neurons themselves. Um, so it's worth mentioning at this point the, uh, a very um, uh, prominent, well-known theory of schizophrenia known, known as the aberrant salience hypothesis. And uh, this was put forward by uh, Shishij Kapoor around 10 years ago. And this hypothesis was very much based on the incentive salience account of dopaminergic function. And, and uh, he proposed that uh, this abnormal phasic release of dopamine, so a kind of random phasic release of dopamine essentially, confers incentive stimuli, on, uh, incentive salience on random stimuli or whatever you happen to be looking at at that time. So if I'm looking around the room and I suddenly get a squirt of dopamine and I notice Charles is looking at me, I think, why, why the hell is she looking at me? Does she want to kill me? Um, and, and in his account, the delusions are a, a, a cognitive scheme that the patient develops to explain this aberrant salience experience. So in this, in this account, he's not really positing any, any abnormal learning, any abnormal cognition. It's a kind of a, a reasonable explanation of these aberrant salience experiences. But this, uh, this is a very popular account, but in some ways it doesn't quite, um, uh, it doesn't quite ring, ring true. So for, for one thing, delusions seem to be so strange that there does seem to be some abnormal learning taking place. It seems surprising that you could explain them all through uh insensitive salience experiences just engendering the, 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 these the apparently rational cognitive explanations. Secondly, exp incentive salience is supposed to be good. Uh, and it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to make you approach things and, 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 and uh, work for them. But uh, schiz the schizophrenic psychosis in particular is characteristically an extremely aversive state. Um, you perceive threats everywhere. It's, it's, it's a frightening state. Uh, now, this explanation might work much better, in fact, for something like manic psychosis, where people feel uh, the world is full of opportunity and they're prepared to go and work for it. But for uh, schizophrenic psychosis, it seems, it seems to be missing something important. So, um, on the other hand, uh, people have also tried to look at how you might explain um, schizophrenic symptoms using the uh, reward prediction error hypothesis as opposed to the ins incentive salience hypothesis. And a, a huge amount of work um, on this subject was done by Paul Fletcher and his colleagues, uh, Phil Corlett and Graham Murray in Cambridge uh, uh, in the last 10 years. 
And they devised tasks in which you uh, could elicit what ought to be either reward prediction error signals or uh, causal inference prediction error signals where there was no explicit reward in the task. There were just causal inferences that, that were there to be made. And, and he showed that in uh, the salient conditions in each of these tasks, and by salient he just means that it's a condition that ought to elicit a prediction error. Um, in control subjects, you see this uh, substantial signal in the uh, midbrain in the reward prediction error uh, time of the task and, the, and in the causal inference task. But in the schizophrenic subjects, this pattern is completely distorted. So there's no difference uh, between the, the prediction error time and the non-prediction error time in, in each of these paradigms. And this finding was then subsequently replicated um, with some interesting kind of laterality effects uh, by Morris et al. But the weird thing is, is that uh, despite this very abnormal uh, bold response, the learning in the actual task was almost normal. And so it didn't really, it, 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 was, it was a great finding, but it didn't seem to uh, translate to a, a, a behavioral effect. So the, there are various possibilities for why, that, why this might be the case. The, the, one possibility is the subjects are just doing the task in a different way. Um, or another possibility, which uh, Fletcher and Frith talk about in their paper, is that perhaps this is not the actual reward prediction error itself, but the but encoding the, the precision of, the, of a reward prediction error or other updates uh, encoded somewhere else. And if the precision is perhaps abnormal, uh, but the, reward, the prediction error is still being encoded elsewhere, that perhaps this allows people to be able to do um, the task better than you otherwise would expect. So coming on to modeling um, delusions, and firstly, I'm going to talk about jumping to conclusions. Now, the, this um, Bees task has become extremely popular in, in, in schizophrenia research because unlike those paradigms I just talked about uh, just now, it, it's, it's a paradigm in which uh, the behavior of schizophrenic subjects tends to be uh, reliably abnormal. And, you, and uh, I guess most of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, you essentially show uh, the subject these two jars, or you show a picture of these two jars on the computer, and uh, one of them has a kind of 80 to 20 uh, ratio of green to yellow beads, and another has an 80 to 20 ratio the opposite way around. And you put them below the desk, and then you start to draw out a sequence and ask people to uh, judge which jar they are coming from. And there's different ways of doing it. You can ask them to just stop you as soon as they've decided and they don't need to see any more. Or you can ask them to rate the probability of uh, each jar after seeing every single bead. And, there's no, and the task never stops. You just keep, you keep going. And uh, it was found by Philippa Garrity and colleagues uh, 30 years ago that... Um, most normal subjects seeing this sequence would decide on either bead number three or bead number five that they're quite happy that this is the, the, the mainly green jar. And, and you can see that here, plotted here. But on these deluded uh, psychotic subjects, uh, you can see almost half of them are deciding on the very first bead, that they don't need to see any more, this jar is green. Um, and this seemed to be a, uh, the first really uh, robust evidence that there's something odd or something wrong going on in, in, in cognition in, in schizophrenia. But um, this task has been used many, many, many times, but, but people haven't really um, explored exactly what is going on behind this reasoning abnormality. So for one thing, subjects might be overweighting evidence. So... Uh, if, if you uh, think of it with an in, uh, aberrant salience hat on, if you have a, a big squirt of, uh, of dopamine uh, on each bead, it's bigger than it should be, you might update your probabilities of the uh, jar more than people update their um, probabilities. <laughs> or you might uh, reach the same conclusion that after only one bead, it's probably 65, 70% likely to be the green jar. But that threshold, that probability is good enough for you and you're willing to make a decision on that basis. So maybe you just have a lower decision threshold. Um, and I think to begin with, people were much more in the overweighting evidence camp. 
Uh, but in a, uh, uh, a study done by Bruno Averbeck in the Suki Shergill's lab a few years ago, he showed that uh, in, a, in a sequence learning task where you could actually quantify how much people learn from positive feedback and from negative feedback, he showed that the, uh, the patients seemed to learn less from positive feedback than the controls. So if anything, they were underweighting positive evidence, not overweighting it. And what does this mean for the beads task? Well, he gave the beads task to those same group of patients, and he showed he replicated this uh, classic effect of, of about half of them deciding on the first bead. But he also showed that the, the less people learned from positive feedback in his other task, the more likely they were to decide on the first bead, i.e. The, the, the people who were jumping to conclusions were also the people who were learning least from evidence. So it did not seem to be an overweighting evidence uh, phenomenon. Uh, and then um, Michael um, Matusis, who um, uh, then uh, uh, jumped in with an analysis of uh, lots of uh, uh, draws to decision beads data, and he um, modeled these using two different models. So this first model was an uh, ideal Bayesian observer model, which had three parameters. And uh, these parameters are very interesting because people have never really, I, I don't think people have ever really uh, examined this uh, question. But uh, so one of the parameters was a cost of the wrong decision. So it may be that the patient doing this task just doesn't care about the experiment, just picks the first bead and thinks, OK, I'm going to decide, I'm going to get out of here, I'm going to take the money and, and go. I don't, I don't care about doing your experiment properly. I, they have no uh, very little cost of making a wrong decision, or they could have a difference in their sampling cost. So they could be think they could be more embarrassed about asking the experimenter for another bead. Um, and from these two costs, you can compute a, a value of either deciding red or deciding blue, or uh, of sampling again. And the other important uh, parameter which he had in his model was this, was this, this temperature parameter uh, governing the decision noise. So uh, he talked a bit about this uh, yesterday, but I, I don't know how familiar people are with um, softmax decision model, so I'll just go through this again quickly. So this softmax model allows you to convert a difference in values between two options into an actual decision. And uh, so if you plot on this x-axis, how much better the, the red decision seems to you than the other options, i.e. If, if red is better, then you're in this part of the graph. If, there is, if it's worse, then you're in this part of the graph. And on the y-axis, you've got the probability of deciding uh, red, actually making that decision. Now, if you're a perfectly rational decision maker, then the minute you're in this half of the graph, you should decide red with probability 1, i.e. this graph should be a step function that goes like this. But obviously, we're not perfectly rational decision makers. There's some, there's some st stochasticity in our responding. And the more stochasticity there is, the flatter this curve gets. So even if red, there is an advantage to choosing red at this point, say, I might still be 20% likely to choose blue, um, or, or et cetera, et cetera. So he had that model, and he also compared this with a much simpler model, which just, in effect, took a ratio of red to blue beads and as soon as it was over a threshold, chose the, the jar as being red, simply that. Um, and there were some interesting, he found some interesting things. So setting, in order to estimate the parameters, he had to set the cost of the wrong decision to a, a set rate for everybody. But this revealed that there didn't seem to be any difference between groups in the cost of sampling. People didn't mind about asking for other beads. <coughs> but what did really jump out was the, um, difference between the, the acutely paranoid patients, the psych acutely psychotic patients, and these remitted patients in healthy controls. You can see this, they had, the acutely paranoid patients had a much, much higher uh, temperature parameter. They seem to be much, ma making much noisier responses. And uh, this also does come with the caveat, as Michael mentioned yesterday, that if, if, if everything is explained by an increase in this decision temperature parameter, it may be that the subject is just noisier, or it may be just that, that your model doesn't contain the key thing that is making the basis, that which is encoding the basis on which they're making their decision. But uh, another interesting thing was that, that the, the paranoid patients and the remitted patients actually seemed to be using, had more evidence for using the simpler model 
whereas the healthy controls seem to favour the more complex model where people looked into the future and, 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 uh, and gauged how many uh, draws are remaining, etc. So this, this is the kind of uh, result which would be great for psych uh, computational psycho uh, psychiatry to develop. You know, a, a, a test that can differentiate between groups on the basis of a diagnosis, whether symptoms are present or not, and then maybe another test that can, uh, can, can quantify the amount of uh, symptoms, i.e. a kind of state test rather than a trait uh, test. But um, in this kind of procession from uh, thinking, I evaluating the probabilities of states and then acting, is it that this, this uh, temperature parameter, uh, this, the, uh, may, uh, this noisy decision making might explain the whole of these jumping to conclusions type effects? Well, if you do the draws to decision uh, uh, test in schizophrenic patients, you do find that the effect size for the draws to decision uh, is very, very high in, in, the, in those patients. So this effect size is around one. But if you eliminate this deciding uh, aspect and just ask them to rate what they think of the probabilities of the jar after every bead, so you're taking away this, this softmax decision part, um, they still perform abnormally, but less so. So the, the effect size is smaller uh, in this rating of certainty after every bead. So it may be um, that, that there is still some abnormal rating of, of the probability of the jar, but uh, the evidence for this is not, is not amazing. So these, this is the best <laughs> evidence I could find. And um, this is from a study by Peters and Garrity, and you can see that this deluded group plotted here in blue, and seeing a sequence of bees going red, 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 green, and you can see that they just seem to make a bigger deflection here when they see uh, counter evidence, and again here. Um, but these effects are not big, and this is, I think, probably a much more characteristic sample. I think it's a bigger sample. These are delusional schizophrenic patients plotted in pink here and healthy controls in red, and you can see that there is a bit of a bigger adjustment, but it's not, it's, it's not hugely impressive. So moving on now, the, um, the, is a, we're now to the question of why people might stick to conclusions. Uh, because the, the, the problem with explaining delusions using the, the jumping to conclusions uh, model is that whatever your explanation of jumping to conclusions, whether it's, whether it's lower decision thresholds or more st stochasticity in decision making, or even belief more a greater belief updating, none of these explain how delusions can become fixed because you need the opposite process to, to explain how they, they are maintained. You have an increased learning rate process in the beginning and then a, a, a no learning rate um, following that. So we tried to, to uh, look at this phenomenon in schizotypal subjects, um, doing another beads task, but asking them to rate the probability of each bead at, uh, and employing a change of jar in the middle. So this is a bit like a, a reversal learning kind of paradigm. And uh, we modeled their responses using this uh, Christoph's uh, hierarchical Gaussian filter. And the uh, important details are that you, here's the B that the subject sees. And uh, at this next level is the, the probability of that bead um, coming from the red jar from the subject's point of view. And at the top here, we have this volatility term, the subject uh, the extent to which the subject believes that the jar might change at any point. And obviously you think if the jar is very likely to change, this is going to change, this is going to have a big effect on your perception of uh, a blue bead if you think the jar is currently red. If you think it's very likely to change, you're much more likely to revise your estimate about the identity of the jar if you see counter evidence. If you don't, then you're not. And then at the bottom here, we just have the decision part uh, so this, this uh, is the probability of the jar generating where the subject puts that uh, point on the slider with a bit of softmax temperature uh, decision noise at the bottom. And if you plot out these quantities, so the, the, the graph on the next slide has this, uh, this x3, x2 and x1 plotted out. You can see the effect that this volatility uh, belief has uh, um, on the other variables. So uh, on the bottom here, you have the beads that people actually see, the blue, red, blue, red, etc. Uh, the diamonds are where they actually put the um, pointer on the sliding scale. 
and the purple line is the model fit. Um, and if you look at the top, you can see this, this belief about the volatility. This is a low schizotypy subject, and it's characteristic of a low schizotypy subject. Um, you see the belief about the volatility doesn't really change throughout. It starts at the level and, and, and kind of stays still. And this means that uh, at this second level, uh, plotting the tendency towards the, the red or blue jars, that uh, the subject believes fairly quickly that the jar is red, but they retain these large confidence intervals about their estimate. They retain some substantial uncertainty about this estimate uh, throughout. And then this means that when the evidence changes, they can make a rapid update to their belief. And, uh, and so uh, very quickly, they, they switch to the blue jar uh, over, over here. But if you compare this uh, to a... Uh, a highly schizotypal subject, you get a very different picture. So this subject, you can see, uh, reaches a decision about the uh, red beads fairly early on, but takes much, much, much longer to revise this belief after the, after the evidence changes. So he takes almost the end of the sequence to, to be really sure. And uh, in fact, this, this is a reversal learning uh, problem in, in effect, although reversal inference, I guess you'd say. And uh, you can see this, the model explains this by starting off at the same level of volatility as before, but then declining and declining. And this means that although the confidence intervals about the jar uh, shrink because you're, you, you think it's less likely to change, you become more confident about the jar, but then when the evidence changes, it takes you much, much longer to change your mind because the learning rate is proportional to the uncertainty at this level, as Christoph was saying yesterday. And this level at which is asymptotes M is, is significantly correlated with the degree of schizotypy across all our subjects. And so what we're, what we're wondering is whether this uh, level M is proportional to, or, or, or en perhaps encoded by, uh, activity at midbrain uh, dopamine two receptors, and why would why would this be? So in this is this task that uh, Hanneke's task, which um, uh, Mark talked about yesterday, um, this is a reversal learning paradigm, and in which the the correct response uh, rewarded seventy percent of the time in the first half of the task was this uh, these yellow bars, and then in the second half of the task, the correct response rewarded seventy percent of the time was the blue response. And subjects had to learn to press this, and then they had to le learn that they had to stop pressing that and press this instead. And um, the subjects with this polymorphism, which results in a slightly higher uh, level of uh, dopamine at these uh, D2 receptors in the striatum, just made more perseverative, perseverative errors than uh, these other subjects. Um, so this is the exact same kind of um, effect, although the paradigm is, is slightly different. So maybe this, this, this D2 receptor hyperactivity is actually uh, something that is causing delusions to be maintained rather than to arise uh, in the first place. And maybe it has something to do with the uh, precision, of, um, precision of policies rather than of, of, of prediction errors. Um, so lastly, oh, we're doing good time. Okay. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through some models of uh, negative symptoms. So model, um, trying to model uh, negative symptoms basically comes down to this very, very, very simple question, which is why not act to get reward? And this sounds like a, uh, the ideal question for anyone uh, studying uh, reinforcement learning. Unfortunately, there are a lot of, um, there are many, many answers to this question. Um, but we can review some potential ones. So for one explanation might be that you just don't value rewards. Uh, maybe people with schizophrenia just don't enjoy things to the same extent that other people do. People thought this for a long time because they don't express the same enjoyment as other people do. Um, there may be a problem of learning to associate certain stimuli with, with rewards. So if you can't, if you can't, um, uh, associate rewards with certain stimuli, then when you see those stimuli, you won't act to get the reward. There may be more complex things going on. So you might not be able to learn the values of performing particular actions. Or you might not be able to compare the uh, values of one stimulus versus the values of another stimulus and, and, and decide on which one is better. Uh, 
you may have problems uh, doing cost benefit analysis. So the cost, if the costs of doing anything always seem to outweigh uh, the benefits of that action, then, then um, you might not act. And lastly, if you don't explore your environment, <clears throat> then you never find new stimulus reward pairings and you just remain stuck in the same uh, series of, of, of habits without discovering new rewards. Um, so uh, this is all uh, uh, taken from um, a paper by Strauss et al., uh, which I recommend. Uh, it's all based on work done by him and Jim Gold's lab um, in uh, Maryland and Baltimore. So begin, answer, to answer this first question, it seems that if you actually uh, test uh, subjective and neural hedonic responses in schizophrenia that they seem normal. So people do seem to enjoy rewards the same amount as uh, uh, normal subjects, it's just they don't seem to act to go and get them. So this one perhaps can be struck off the list. So what about learning to associate stimuli with rewards? Right. So the interesting thing, as I was alluding to with uh, in the study in uh, Paul Fletcher um, a, a few slides ago, is that when uh, in, in these conditioning paradigms where people have to associate stimuli which result in gain 80% of the time or loss 80% of the time or gain 90% of the time or loss 90% of the time, they perform pretty much the same as normal subjects. And only in this single condition in this study where the stimuli predicted response with 90% probability uh, did they fall down. So they seem pretty good at learning uh, stimuli response associations. Uh, in uh, the in this kind of using these kind of striatal reinforcement learning paradigms, uh, which is odd on the face of it if you think that most of the pathology is in the striatum. But um, there seems to be more evidence for these more complex functions centered in in prefrontal cortex. So there is evidence which I don't have time to go into now, but. Patients with high negative symptoms aren't able to represent uh, specific values of actions and that they're not able to compare the values of, of different states, so sub, uh, functions subserved by orbitofrontal, ventral medial, prefrontal cortex. Likewise, that they have difficulty comparing, uh, weighing up costs and, and values of, of acting, and uh, likewise, that they seem to have uh, problems uh, um, initiating exploration, uh, again, another prefrontal function. But one really nice study that's worth looking at um, that came out last year was a study by Michael Frank and Anne Collins, published in the Journal of Neuroscience. And, um, and they looked at this apparent uh, reinforcing, reinforcement learning, apparent but mild reinforcement learning deficit in, in schizophrenia, and, and asked, is it, could it actually be explained purely by cognitive problems? So even might, might even this effect not actually be anything to do with, uh, with uh, a reinforcement learning problem. And the way they assessed this was by getting people to uh, learn simple stimuli response associations to a set number of stimuli. So in different blocks, um, they were shown one stimulus, they had to make a simple response, they had one, two, or key one, two, or three, and they were told whether they were right or wrong. And in the different blocks, they had different numbers of stimuli response associations to learn. And you can see how they did on this graph. You, uh, this is the number of uh, trials it took them to get to a high standard. And you can see the schizophrenic patients are just slower than these, these, these healthy controls. And they don't reach quite the same standard. And the way they model this task, you, they, they model it using the standard reinforcement learning uh, parameters. So they had the learning rate and the decay rate of the, the reinforcement learning. And this, the, they had a softmax temperature and this, this another noise uh, parameter. But they also had a working memory capacity, which allowed patients, and well, allowed all subjects to uh, learn a stimulus response, uh, response association with a learning rate of one. I, you, see, you see it once and then you know it, um, instead of making an incremental gain like in, in reinforcement learning. Um, so this working memory capacity was limited, though. So you couldn't hold six stimulus response associations in your working memory. You could only hold a few. And so they had some working memory parameters, like the capacity, the decay rate from working memory, and the trade-off between working memory and reinforcement learning. 
And when they looked at their data, they discovered that these reinforcement learning parameters actually showed no difference between the patients and the normal subjects. So the, the learning rate was the same. There was no difference in the softmax parameter either, which is quite, quite striking. The only differences are these ones plotted in red of the, uh, were working memory differences. So there's a loss of working memory capacity and a higher decay rate from working memory and therefore greater reliance on reinforcement learning rather than working memory in the patients. So this is a really nice illustration of how a, 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 a more sophisticated model can tease out these, these uh, subtle differences. Um, so just to summarize, that's uh, everything I've said, and thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>